Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, many of you know that uh, I'm part of the uh, El Camino with uh, my brother. Uh, this was organized through the New York Times. So I have to make the confession we did not walk the entire distance that would have taken a couple of months. So we, hawked, we hiked pieces of it. Weeks. On the average, we hike about 10 miles uh, one day, we hike about 16 miles. But as you can tell from the pictures, uh, parts of it are fairly hilly, and other parts it's flat by walking in Kansas. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, why did we decide to, uh, to uh, hike this? Uh, Number of reasons. One, as many of you know, we were raised Catholic, so we did go on a couple of pilgrimages in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, which is way back in the mid 1950s. Uh, also, for historical reasons, it's, you know, Spain has a lot of history going all the way back to the Celtic period. Um, and just being outside and walk. And you get to meet a lot of people, not just people in the group. Group, but other walkers. Uh, as you can tell from the graph, uh, it goes up to 2019. Uh, you can see how many more people have started to walk uh, this particular uh, trail. It's become extremely popular. So, to, to start, uh, most people, go ahead, uh, start in France and just across the border. Um, go ahead. And um, cross the Pyrenees, and then you end up in uh, Roncesvalles, I can't quite pronounce it, in northern Spain. Go ahead. So in, in France, um, in this particular town, there's a large fort. Um, built by George the Fourteenth um, during uh, the various wars. <coughs> so walking through through, through uh, down the streets, but, and I also have to apologize. I will go fairly quickly from the pictures. One hundred and fifty pictures. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm going to make it. But, So, like many of these uh, smaller towns, are very picturesque. And uh, some of these pictures were not taken by me, obviously, but taken either by my brother or by other uh, people in the group. So, getting to the top, and you can see the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. And that's the group. Uh, interesting mixture of uh, people from uh, Mexico, people from Texas. Uh, some people were belong to were Catholic. Some people were not. Uh, also, a Jewish family participated. So it's an interesting, fairly interesting group. <laughs> so in in France, uh, the, the symbol or the route marker for the uh, El Camino is what you see there, a stripe of white and red. So probably we're at about 4,000 foot elevation. So uh, during medieval times, this was probably the most dangerous uh, stretch of, of the El Camino due to the weather, due to uh, uh, gangs of thieves and so forth. Watch a sheep. <laughs> but if you ever hiked in other parts of Europe, like, uh, like England or Iceland, uh, you see a lot of sheep there too. So across the border from France to Spain. 
And that's the Spanish uh, marking for El Camino, the shell. And supposedly, St. James the Apostle carried the shell around. What does the 13 mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So what month was this? This was October. Yeah, the summer gets hot, and especially in the last summers, the last years. Hunt it's in the spring, it's, it's not the unusual. So we arrive at the main point, uh, Gavic Point in North of Spain, in Bronze of Palace. Uh, during the Middle Ages, there was a large monastery, there were as many as 100 monks who helped out the pilgrims, especially when they had to recuperate from the arduous hike across the Pyrenees. It's also some historical uh, significance because if you know your early European history, Charles uh, Charlemagne invaded Spain, and one of the few places where he was defeated by the Basques as a retreat, and this was actually the battle site. And along the route, you see lots of statues of the Apostle James. Worcester. So, uh, 790 kilometers to go. <laughs> so, we usually start at uh, about 8 30 in the morning. Um, the first uh, morning, uh, Peter and I overslept because at this time the uh, of the year in Spain, which is on the same time zone as Western Europe, but it's on the same longitude as England. So it didn't get light until eight o'clock. So that first morning, it kind of confused us. And then uh, I figured out how to set the alarm on my cell phone. So we were... So very picturesque, you know, you go through the hills and mountains. The trail, as you, as you can see in the pictures, are, is very well laid out, uh, easy walking service, mostly gravel. That's my brother, Peter. So we end up in uh, Pamplona, uh, famous for its so uh, bull runs. Um, Um, it's surrounded by medieval and 17th century fortifications. And this is one of the streets where the, run, where the bulls run down. That's why I see all these markings on this street. Interpret that any way you like. Uh, it's as, as, actually, it's uh, Nationalism among the Basques is very, very strong. They essentially want independence. And that's a statue of St. Furman, uh, a medieval, a early medieval bishop. And I can't quite tell you who this, but you see the statues all over uh, the Florida, including the, uh, the cathedral. The city hall. And uh, with the New York, with the New York Times, also about the food. Uh, in fact, that's way too much food. Also, uh, lots of wine. None of us have wrong, but uh, wine is inexpensive. I would say a dollar fifty-two dollars a glass back then. Statue of Saint Ferdinand. And especially in Spain, um, Portugal, uh, I have never been to Italy, but probably the same. The, uh, the altars are very elaborate. 
So this is the Gothic part of the church. This is more of the Baroque part, and the Mass was being said at the time we were there. That was up in the view from our hotel room next morning. So we went back on the road. Um, so we walked from Bologna to Burgos, uh, about eight, point, eight and a half hours, 12.5 miles. We did not begin to walk the entire distance, it's more than 12 miles. Part of the group. And, so, did you walk away and then be bus to the next place? Right, right, right. As you can tell, the topography is definitely flattening out. So the temperatures were probably in the 70s, so it was fairly pleasant uh, walking weather. And in Portugal as well, you still see shepherds with sheep. That's the only place where I've seen that. So into Burgos, uh, very beautiful town, uh, has uh, Roman antecedents. Um, in fact, the uh, the guy sitting there is one of the support staff of the group. Uh, the gate uh, dates back to the fourth century Rome, Roman Empire, and the cathedral. And at uh, these various places, the New York Times hired a local guy uh, facing us, uh, gave us a tour of the uh, of the cathedral. Interesting that uh, medieval cathedrals uh, you see these picturesque statues of, or sculptures. So in this case, it's a man uh, fixing his shoes. Um, the 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 uh, the the, lo the, uh, the Spanish there were two leaders, uh, both from Spain. Uh, one guy was actually from the Basque area, was still a very devout uh, Catholic, and so we had a discussion with him um, about how many people go to to church in Spain on a regular basis um, during the Franco rule, of course. People were you know, encouraged strongly to go to, to Mass every Sunday. He said, uh, and this was in, 19, in 2018, probably 20% go to the church now, uh, as, as, as it has been turned all over. Uh, church attendance is way down. And yes, I, I, I actually was the special documentation. So from Burgos, we go to um, Carion de los Andes. Again, it's a, a historical site, also a location of a, a large monastery, and that's actually where we stay. Again, as you can tell, it's fairly flat, fairly easy walking. Um, 19th century canal. Uh, Spain went through the same phenomenon as the United States, and England did building canals for transportation. But it didn't last long. And, they were okay. and you see these picturesque uh, churches um, all over the place. Uh, it was closed so we could not go in. Uh, as you can tell from the style, probably, it dates back to the Romanesque period. Uh, 10th, 11th centuries.
uh, another uh, marker of the uh, El Camino that is close uh, to St. James. And the villages, the, the route is well marked. So this is the, the monastery. Um, uh, it is especially well known for, for the cloister. Uh, and it's, it's no longer a monastery, obviously, it's a large hotel. So this a picture that I obviously did not take. This is off the Wikipedia. <laughs> So the main entrance into the uh, used to be the monastery. Uh, it was really tough to uh, cut pictures out to alleviate the presentation. I have several pictures of the interior. I just decided to have to cut something out. So the next is from um, from the monastery to Leon, which is another uh, large medieval uh, city in Spain. Uh, again, Roman, <coughs> Roman origins. We had good weather throughout this uh, period of, of a couple of weeks. Uh, might have rained a little bit tonight, but otherwise we had dry weather in spite of the rainy skies. So there's quite a few uh, Romans, uh, Roman ruins left in Leon, although we, we did not uh, see them. So that's uh, how we saw the, uh, the cathedral, the, the front part of it was on the restoration. But this is what it, what it looks like. You know that if the uh, uh, churches and the clergy people, salaries, et cetera, are subsidized in Spain as they are in Germany? I don't know. I assume there's been a movement to separate church and state as it's been the case in many parts of the earth, but it's only a guess. <coughs> and lots of food. So um, this is the third, the second festival that we experienced. We were in Bilbao for a couple of days on our own. It's a big festival going on. Lots of food uh, near Leon. Uh, Plaza, all these food stands. And we did not partake because we had big dinner coming up at eight o'clock. Spain, as is the case with many of the Mediterranean countries, dinner is not until 8, 8 30, 9 o'clock. So. <laughs> so from Leon, we walked to Astorcas. Uh, pilgrims. And uh, some places uh, people have set up little food stands. Uh, it was fairly warm that day, so we were able to get, buy some drinks. Did you meet people doing this as a pilgrimage? Yes. Uh, uh, good question. Uh, even though it was October, there were still a lot of people on the, on, on the trail, people outside of the group, young people, old people. We saw people from Asia, Japan, Scotland, Australia, from all over the place. 
And yes, we did have some conversations with them. I remember talking to two young women. I had a great deal of trouble understanding them, only to find out they were from Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> So, start with Spain. So, here definitely uh, Roman ruins are still seen, as you can see right here, and also uh, mosaics. So, Rome, the Roman Empire had a very strong presence in, in Spain. It was one of the wealthiest uh, provinces in the empire. So what is interesting in Astorgas is that several of the buildings uh, were designed by a famous architect named Gaudi. He is the one who designed the, the cathedral, which is still under construction in Barcelona. And I can see the picture in the top corner here. Uh, probably some pictures of it. I've never been there. So this uh, was designed by, uh, by him was to be the Episcopal Palace. Um, very interesting design, but the bishop uh, rejected it. This was around the turn of the century, 1900. Uh, so it's a uh, museum exhibiting various items from the medieval period, from the, uh, um, from the Alcamino, as well as from the Roman era. Again, the statue of St. James. Why well, so we'll get to that, but so, <laughs> um, in the uh, seventh, eighth century, uh, people or someone discovered the body of St. James and in, uh, in San Diego. But you can interpret that any way you like. So, <laughs> But that resulted in the in this particular building trap. So, from what I have read, uh, there were skeptical interpretations about various cities and towns in northern Spain competing for business. So, one way in the village is to attract business is to find this particular miraculous whatever. And Santiago won out. It's, uh, during the Middle Ages, it was the third most popular uh, pilgrimage destination after Holy Land and after Rome. So, from Asurgos to Lugo, which is another city with, with uh, the beginnings of the Roman Empire. Um, this area of Spain um, still has some Celtic uh, cultural traditions. Uh, for example, this, this early medieval uh, church. So these are small provincial local churches. It appears that it's still being used as a church. Well, many, of course, are not. But So now we enter in Galicia, which is the province, uh, the northwestern province of Spain, the location of uh, San Diego. So again, uh, the church has some certificates for pilgrims. Uh, Again, typical style from the early early Middle Ages. So what it reads is to all of the pilgrims who walk in eternity. Now, early baptismal font. And into Lugo. Lugo's uh, claim to fame is that it's the only city in Western Europe that's still surrounded by Roman walls. And again, a very elaborate altar. And 
McPherson and Boucher and Scott, so Eric, the leader of the So you can walk on top of the walls around the entire city. <laughs> and another first <laughs> one. So from Lugolo, we want to. Uh, Just to send you up. Yes. Yes. Um, until the early 20th century, the uh, farmers in Spain and Portugal as well, as we saw those structures there, uh, it, these are grain routes. So uh, once the, uh, the wheat or whatever crop, they harvest it, they store them in these particular structures. Santiago, uh, quite an interesting city. Again, um, it was an ancient Roman uh, cemetery to begin with. Um, then, uh, this part of Spain was never conquered by the Muslims in the 7th, 8th centuries, although raids did occur, but it was never, never, uh, it remained separate from the rest of Muslim Spain. And, much of the reconquering occurred from this part of Spain as well as from France. Um, the cathedral uh, and various palaces surrounding the plaza. Uh, this is an, uh, a hostel, hostel that was built by Philip II in the early 16th century. It's now a very expensive hotel. And the inevitable uh, oyster. So uh, the cathedral, uh, the oldest oldest part of the cathedral dates back to the 10th century. But uh, over the centuries, uh, it's been added on. Uh, the front side here obviously dates back to at least to the 16th century, as from the uh, from the architecture. And this is the the day-to-day uh, -day entrance into the uh, cathedral and definitely much more medieval. And this is the tomb of St. James, so it is claimed. So um, we started the, the trip with a mass in northern Spain at the monastery. Uh, and then we concluded the trip with uh, a very elaborate high mass uh, here in the cathedral. Um, interestingly, uh, the Jewish family, everyone attended. Um, it's quite a ceremony to, to, uh, to witness. The, at the height of right after the raising of the host, the, uh, uh, 15 young men come out and they uh, swing back the, the incense container. You can't quite see it because it's too fast, but uh, it's quite enough. <laughs> And you see music, you hear music all over town in the, in the old part of town. Um, it's very interesting walking. Again, I have to cut pictures out. Um, pictures of uh, churches, chapels, uh, convents, uh, monasteries, all basically dating to the uh, late Middle Ages, the Renaissance period. Um, you see, again, as typical in Europe, and most of the have been to Europe, you see these little side terraces where people drink the coffee. You know. That's very, very enjoyable walking through the streets, but again, I get that in the scriptures out. And the Atlantic Ocean. So, 
officially, unofficially, the pilgrimage ends in, in Santiago. However, in the Middle Ages, a lot of people continued to walk for another couple of days through the Spanish Lens End. So this is the looking at the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is the same latitude as roughly as uh, New Jersey. Uh, the climate is a lot milder than New Jersey, from what I gather. But, and so again, that's with uh, Eric and two brothers. Tip. Yes, sir. it looked like you just had day packs. So they right. forward your luggage. Forward. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, it was a large van that transported us, and uh, so they carried all the, the, the all the luggage was up in the van. They periodically stopped because they didn't want to. They want to make sure that we had plenty of food. So okay. in the mid morning, noon, mid afternoon, they stopped. They set the table. They laid out all the food. <laughs> Plus, in the morning when we got started, they had the table laid out with all snacks. So starvation was far <laughs> totally different. I can't imagine what it was like for the pilgrims back in the Middle Ages. I'm sure they did not have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did the did the Organizers do anything to facilitate the spiritual aspects? No. no. Uh, it was completely secular. Uh, we did have conversations with uh, Eric on kind of a funny story. So, as many of you know, I have a strong background in history, Greek saw in history. So I had no idea you know, what his background was, except he was from that region of uh, Northeast Spain. So Peter and I had a conversation with him, and I said, you know, there's this this there's this historical connection between the Netherlands and Spain. And he rolled his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> then Peter said, he has a master. He has a master's degree in history. <laughs> so obviously he knew that. Now I'm going to the complex history behind it. But uh, in the late, from the late 15th century until the wars of independence, the, the United Provinces and Belgium, Flanders, that entire area. Um, were part of, were reigned by first by Charles V and then by his son, uh, Philip II. And then, then with the Reformation in the early 16th century and then the outbreak of the Calvinist movement in Spain, in the, in the, in the Netherlands and Belgium as well, it's today Belgium. And it resulted in the war of independence. And ultimately, of course, the United Provinces won its independence, but not what's today Belgium. So that was the connection. Again, if you're from, from the Netherlands or a strong historical background, you know that. I mean, so that was, that's why he rolled his eyes. <laughs> Just, but otherwise, there was no, no spiritual, Just purely on your own. Yes? Two questions. First, the date. So this was October of uh, 2018. Okay, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. That's why I'm not seeing any map. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes. Did you get a certificate that showed yes. you had one? Yes, but I yes. somewhere. <laughs> well, we also got a whole packet that shell. You had a shell. Yeah, right? shell and a little stamp booklet, so you could stop in various places and get a stamp and. I wasn't terribly interested in it. I was taking pictures. <laughs> so of that roughly 500 miles you guys covered. Right. How much of that did you actually walk? You said walk hard. So we walked on the average 10 miles, uh, one day 16 miles, one day 13, 14 miles. I don't know, about half of it. And I. Yes. Did you see and could you describe? 
MCLs for the people who go to Stanford Hill. Yes, we did. Yes, so in Pamplona, uh, we walked by a hostel and we asked if we could walk in and see. They said, it's fine, it's fine because there's no one there. So a bunch of uh, bunk beds, too high, arranged in this room. That's what it looked like. So glad I'm not staying here. <laughs> yeah. uh, my, my brother Martin, who has uh, hiked the uh, BCT and the uh, Appalachian Trail, he has stayed in hostels. Uh, sometimes it's fine, other times you know, it's a lot of snoring and people can't help. It's not necessarily restful sleeping. But again, in the Middle Ages, that's you know, where people stay. I guess they used to. Yes? So, how many pairs of shoes did you bring? And did you get blisters? And how did they do laundry? Okay, um, <laughs> so um, I have a pair of steady, uh, sturdy hiking boots, and that's what I wear when I do my daily walks in the 360 Trail Park. And I also brought a pair of hiking shoes, only because we get to the, to the hotel, and it's usually about four or five o'clock. You know, I want to take those boots off. So, you know, one pair is sufficient. Now, uh, when you talk to my brother, Martin, who's on the PCT, he, he has gone through two pairs of hiking boots. But, you know, they, when you hide the Appalachian or the uh, PCT, you know, they're walking on a very rough surface. Yeah, it's very difficult. Oh, it's very uh, <laughs> we had to do the dog long for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we could take a shower every morning, so uh, so um, I guess we went to, I don't think so. We went to, to Portugal afterwards for 10 days. I don't remember doing laundry. <laughs> 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 it's not a priority, I guess. <laughs> yes? Do you know if the global route has been continuous to since the Middle Ages? So, the religious wars, of course, it defined. I looked it up. I uh, am on Wikipedia, a couple of books. So, it declined very rapidly. Uh, so, the only pilgrims who walked it uh, were from Spain and Portugal, and of course, as you probably know, uh, for about 50 years, Spain and Portugal were unified. Um, but after 1900, the popularity began to increase again from all over Europe. Starting in the 1960s, the, the growth of, uh, of people, or the number of people doing the pilgrimage, have, have increased dramatically. And I suspect a lot of people are not walking because of, because of spiritual reasons. Uh, you know, people want to walk because, again, like I said, for cultural reasons, historical reasons, just to be outside. You saw people from all over the world. Um, I think, if I remember right, uh, in 2018, 160,000 people walked it. So, so you can imagine what impact the COVID had on the economy of North Spain. We only go one direction. Yes, yes, from France west. Right. Now, there are various other routes that feed into it, um, especially from Eastern Europe, Italy. Uh, people from England take a boat to France somewhere and then start walking. I looked up and found out that uh, Spaniards can check a box on their taxes. Oh. And 6% of it, of their reportable income would go automatically to the church. Oh, okay. So that's probably how the upkeep of these buildings right. Is, right. is done, not by local parishes, but right. Not right. By, right. because it's of historical significance, right. so they want to keep those buildings. So in Portugal, uh, all these uh, cathedrals and monasteries that we, we saw, spectacularly beautiful uh, monasteries in Portugal, um, 
They're all uh, state monuments. Uh, they're still used for religious purposes, mass states and all that, but they're owned by the government. So they are the ones who do the restorations and so forth. Yes. Do people worship on the ground? Yes. Uh, parts of it. Uh, parts of the people challenging, but yes, we see we saw people rise up. Any other questions? Uh, quicker than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, you may have said this, but what was the duration of how many days? Uh, the entire trip uh, was two weeks. So we walked, I think, 11 days, uh, one full day in Santiago, and then the, the last day we walked from Santiago to the coast. So, um, REI uh, has trips like this. Uh, what's the other one that I saw? Oh, uh, uh, What's the, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact, um, no, the, um, um, the organization that has classes for people over 65 all over the world. A-A-R-T. Pardon? A-A-R-T. No. Um, anyway, uh, there are various organizations that uh, run this, run these trips. Uh, Couple of years, I know uh, Sierra Club did, uh, and they're all about the same length of length of um, the same number of days. It's pretty standard. So if you, I can highly recommend it if you're physically able to do it. <laughs> Hello. How I'm was watching a um, thing online about the Camino in Spain. I didn't know you were calling me. They're talking on the phone. Okay, this concludes the uh, program. All right.